with a potential alternative for 100 low lead, why should Swift Fuel be considered? Well, I believe, to my knowledge, we're the only fuel out there that is above 100 octane and that is unleaded and that is completely hydrocarbon based and can be made from biomass as well. The three most important parameters I would say that you need if you're trying to have a, uh, a long and healthy relationship with your 550 engine is the fact that you should look at three parameters. Number one is power. Make sure you have the proper octane. There's a minimum specification we have for Swift as its composition was fixed last December 9th. The minimum composition gives us a minimum octane number, motor octane, of 102. On the nominal fuel that we would have right here, for example, which is the Swift biofuel, would be 104.9 octane. That's just how it comes out, but a minimum octane of 102. So power is the first important thing, such that you don't grenade or torpedo your engine on takeoff, especially. Number two is energy. Separate from power, you have to have the proper energy. Our fuel generally has been proven to have about 15% more energy, i.e. a Piper Arrow that gets 10 gallons per hour would be down to about 8.5 gallons per hour. That to me is important. If we're going to come up with a fuel, I'm a pilot and an engineer, if we're going to come up with a fuel, I want it to be as least as good as 100 low lead is now. The third parameter I'm going to throw at you is cost. You want to make sure that that cost is stable. If the fuel costs $10 or $20 a gallon, it's never going to make it, okay? The interesting thing is that we anticipate, we hope that our fuel will be exactly where it is today, but stable. That's a big difference. Not subject to fluctuations based on world situations and tornadoes and such things as that. Tall order. It is. We've been working at this. My wife Mary and I have been working at this in one way or another through the military. Uh, at Edwards Air Force Base and China Lake Naval Air Warfare Center for quite a, quite a while. Actually, we started down this path at UOP in 1976. So it's not something that just happened overnight. You don't just mix up a magic sauce and hope it works in an airplane. But it also takes a clean slate. Uh, we're a clean slate company. We've been in dealing with power and ordnance and propulsion for, for quite a few years. And uh, we're coming up on our 10th anniversary coming up this January, and we anticipate we'll have it. Now, of course, nobody's heard of Swift, but people have heard of AdFuel, and people have heard of Embry-Riddle and Purdue University, and that's why we are partnering. And a key point of this is to make sure we can partner. We have the idea, the technology, the intellectual property, the way to make it from biomass, but you partner to get the whole thing done. It's not a one-man shop. Freedom through innovation. It's what led us to develop Cirrus Flying 2.0, the framework for a bold new take on private aviation, and as a result, the gap between the aircraft we produce and those of our competitors continues to widen. Cirrus knows where the personal aircraft industry is headed. We're already there. What are the real world issues in getting this into mass production to a point where I can pull up to the Okie Finoki Swamp FBO and say, fill her up with Swift fuel. That's a very, very good question. And the secret is exactly where we're sitting right now with Swift Enterprises and AvFuel. AvFuel is one of the six and the largest distributor of aviation fuels today. Swift cannot, I cannot sell you fuel because I'm not bonded, I don't do anything like that. That's where we go to the big boys, and the big boys being AvFuel specifically, we can go to, and that's how you distribute it. So your second question of how do you produce it, that's actually easier than you think if you start putting things in proper perspective. Right now, there's about 300 million gallons per year that's used, maybe 275, 285, right in there. Our plans are to make 360 million gallons per year. You say, that's a huge amount of fuel. No, it's not. The biomass needed, if we chose biomass in a growing sense, uh, sorghum or corn or things like that, is about the size of Tippecanoe County in Indiana. That's not a big area to supply all the aviation fuels, but that's not how we're going to do it. Basically, we're going to be working with, the good rule of thumb from chemical engineering is, the cheaper the raw material input, the cheaper your final product cost is going to be. Okay? And as our friend flies over, that's it. Uh, so what I wanted to say is, for example, you'll be using the pulp and paper mills in the, in the Northeast, or the Pacific Northwest, or the paper and wood industry in Georgia, or the biomass up in Minnesota. You split this up about six or ten areas, and then the distribution takes care of itself because you work it through a company like AvFuel to be able to do this and broker it. So you get the big guys with you. It takes many, many process steps to go from crude oil to your final aviation fuel, quite a few. It takes three steps to go from our biomass 
to our final aviation fuel, and that's significant from a chemical engineering perspective. You have to basically mill your stuff at the beginning, extract the stuff, convert it to an oxygenate, take that oxygenate and convert it to our fuel. That's a three-step process, so I can add on to existing plants right now. That's really, really pretty easy. So how do you make something like this? I assume you don't just grab a blender, throw in some veggies, and, uh, and let it distill for a while. No, it's actually very interesting that you ask that, because the beginning of this, using any biomass that contains sugar, is you can go to something called an ABE process. That's acetone, butanol, ethanol. Ironically, almost 100 years ago was the first ABE process in commercial production. And that was... Uh, <laughs> All things old maybe do again. Absolutely correct. And they did this because they needed butanol for the butyrate dope for aircraft. As World War I started looming, they also needed acetone for the cordite, for the smokeless propellants that they were making. And so there was a big push. If we didn't go down the um, crude oil type road, we would have gone back to renewable fuels a long time ago. Anyway, we go fast forward about 80 years, and now there's companies all around the world, and specifically in America, America that are developing these acetone, butanol, ethanol plants. So that would be the first step of the process. We get the acetone out of that plant, and then our plant is a, simple, is a relatively straightforward gas phase reactor and distillation column to form our fuels. And that's it. Key point again, our fuels are based on only two components that we make specifically from nature. While you can make these, I'll take, I'll take exhibit A here, while you can take this and get these both of these ingredients from petroleum, from crude oil, you can, but at a great cost, like $25 a gallon. So that's what that would cost. That's why you never want to do it. No. So the irony of this is, while in general, ethanol is more expensive to make biologically, our fuel is less expensive to make biologically. Of course, that has to be proven and it's got to go through everything. You may ask, when would this all happen? We anticipate by the end of 2012, we should be in a pretty good position to fill the market. Integra Release 9 sets a new standard with the easiest to use pilot interface in all of general aviation. Access to any of Release 9's powerful capabilities is as simple as pressing the desired bi-directional page key. Pressing the same key in a desired direction navigates to the clearly labeled tabs with no more guessing as to what a given pilot input would do. Avidyne's Integra Release 9 is the next generation in fully integrated flight deck technology and the easiest to use page and tab user interface is just one of the many benefits designed to make your flying easier and safer. A lot of people in the audience may not have ever heard of Swift and they don't need to. It's, it's not that important. The important thing is that we have a product that they will go through the existing chain to be able to do that and we'll see what happens. And of course with the mandate of lead, people talk about this date and that date and this date and all the other stuff. The reality of the situation is the EPA is not draconian in my estimation. The EPA is going to do it when it makes sense to do it. Our fuel comes out there, it's producible at 300 million gallons, lead will go away. As an example. What changes am I going to have to anticipate as a pilot and an aircraft owner in uh, my big six-cylinder uh, Continental or if I happen to come out with a little four-banger uh, T-Craft one of these days? It's a real good question, and our experience, and again, remember, all of our data that we've gotten from aircraft is through Embry-Riddle, through Cessna, through Piper, through all the OEMs and the testing organization. A few folks who may know something about the process. Yeah, they might know a little <laughs> bit about it. Ironically enough, the higher the demand engine, like, uh, for example, our Grace is our flagship, which is the 1981 Navajo with the 540K non-intercooled turbos. I mean, that's oh, incredible, okay? okay? Tankers, old son of a gun, well, I tell you what, the baby is beautiful. It's our spirit of freedom. <laughs> but the point is, that's exactly what we're making the fuel for. The higher the performance the aircraft is, the more seamless it is, okay? We're going through materials compatibility tests to make sure the elastomers and the seals and the, all that other kind of stuff is great, but that's, that's the job. That's part of what we have to do to keep things safe. Um, but as far as starting goes, actually, ironically enough, we've never had a problem with any of those things. We've never had a problem on RV4s, RV3s, RV6s. Uh, you start, there's, there's one small class of aircraft that I trained in, in back in 1978, uh, M model and J model 150s, you know, the low compression two 200 engines with the How slow Volari. Can you, you go. go. I understand. But the funny thing is, because they had such maldistribution of fuel, it's hard to start those on 100 low lead, yeah. much less anything else. Well, if anything happens on that, we're, we it's not our intent to orphan any aircraft, but if there was a cold starting problem for that, we're, and we noticed maybe a little bit on, on one we have, but it's anecdotal, that's all this is. Well, all we did to fix the problem is put a $200 slick start system on it, and now guess what? Yeah. It works fine. So it's not like you have to put a 17. Small, small price to pay. Well, it's, it's not $17,000 in a FedEx system, is it? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, but I mean, that's the point. I'm a pilot, okay? I've been flying okay. since 1978, so the last thing I want to do is have to change my craft, mm -hmm. okay? I will never want to change the baby on, on doing that. If I can't do it chemically and make sure I can do it real, I have no business being in the business, if that makes sense.